Okay. So this is day 5,000 of the COVID uh, era. Uh, a lot of people are starting to go into uh, another phase, actually. And in fact, um, uh, officially, at least in Vermont, and I think nationally, something has changed this weekend that there's an opening of spigot. There's some spigot somewhere that people are turning officially. And we've had, you know, uh, on the news, these crowds of crazed people uh, partying together, you know, and all of a sudden. So we'll see what happens, you know, in, in two weeks or 10 days. Um, and, um, but how are you doing in phase two as, as writer? Or do you feel there's a phase two? Do you feel that that's just, um, you know, Trump trying to win win the election. Oh no, it's it's still it's the same. I don't know that it's changed. No, uh, I'm not going out much. <laughs> Was that because you're uh, being a good boy, or because it's there's real stuff out there? Where are you? I'm in New York. In New York, hey, yeah. Well, we're still pretty much a lockdown. I mean, there's still stuff out, there, real stuff out there, but you know, it's not so much stuff where we are. Right. That's what. Yeah. That's what I understand. But um, not that it was not that there was that much difference in my life between uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID. I mean, I I pretty much locked myself down writing anyway, uh, and so it, it, the the impact hasn't been as great for me as I think it has been for other people, though. I'm very well, at least with my wife, I'm very well aware that we're not going out much. Uh, but it's, it, it's more the notion of the disease, I think. The, the insecurity of it that's affecting my, my sense of what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know if you know Dr. Faustus, the Thomas Mann. Do I know it? It's my book. Uh, I feel like uh, <laughs> Serena Zeitblum, uh, writing, writing, writing about Adrian Leverkusen, and you know, and the uh, bombs are going off in the background, and the and the planes are flying over, and I uh, and I don't really know where we're headed. Uh, I just know I've got to get to the end of this end of this book and end of this writing about Adrian. Um, and it's a different feeling for me. Uh, how can I explain this? It's um, you. The context has changed. Uh, if 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 like Adorno says, uh, art is uh, what historiography and. Uh, consciousness of suffering, the historiography and what what we're going to suffer from this are both missing in in the in the context of what we're doing. It changes what I think I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going sometimes with with uh, what I'm writing. Also, I'll try. To, also. Um, it's reordering what I want to work on. Uh, before COVID, I thought I had much more time than I do now. It's made me much more con self-conscious of my own mortality, if that makes sense. And, and those two things seem to be having an impact on what I'm doing. What's the reordering? W what has been reordered? Uh, I, okay, let's, for example, I'm, I'm working on a novel and I was about to take time off uh, to work on a short story. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to finish the novel. I'm going to pu push ahead on that and try to get it done because that's more important to me at this point uh, than, than getting, it's, it's a matter of which work is most important to me. And... I just reorder how I'm working, I guess is what I'm saying. 
with the assumption that you don't have as much time as you thought you had. That's right. That's right. I, just, I don't have as much. I'm not at. Um, I feel time is a winged chariot at my back <laughs> more more than I did before. Do you, do you feel that way? You don't have as much time. Um, no, for me, I mean, if you're going to describe this as a as a phase one and a phase two, although I don't pay a lot of attention to Trump and his phases, but uh, the phase one for me, I was in New York City. So, um, you know, the first two months, and I, I live alone, my partner passed five years ago. And my son is also in New York City, but he's riding the trains because of, of his work and his uh, girlfriend is a nurse. So for me to be in their company would, would be very risky. So I haven't seen him. So it was a very isolating experience. I mean, I felt very isolated in New York on, on one level. On another level, being in New York City, um, you know, seven o'clock when, when everybody would be out clapping and banging cans together and I'd go out on my fire escape and you, you felt a certain sense of camaraderie and um, even looking out my window, I could see lights on. So on a, on a very surface level, I didn't feel alone. But of course, you know, I mean, I didn't for two months, I did not sit down um, at a table with another person and have a conversation. You know, the only time I would see anybody is if I was outside walking my dogs or if I went downstairs to do the laundry. And now I'm up in the Finger Lakes area and um, in uh, about 40 minutes outside of Syracuse. And it's very different. I mean, I could, for the first time in two months, I'm going outside without putting a mask on. I mean, I didn't leave a one bedroom apartment for two months without first putting a mask on. So I almost feel like I'm doing something wrong, you know, by going outside and, and I don't have to wash my hands as soon as I come back in. And I have eight acres to wander around on. Um, but the other side of this is that this feels, I feel more isolated in a different way because I can't look out the window and see lights on, you know, so it's, uh, it's a little bit comparing apples and oranges. But um, as far as a, being a writer, for me, the tricky adjustment was that I'm a public space writer. Much of my writing I do out in public. Um, I think there's something about when I write, and I'm sure this is true for most writers, you get very inside your head. And I like being in a library or a coffee shop or in a park where every once in a while I could look up and see someone and um, get outside of my head. So I don't do all of my writing in public spaces, but a lot. So it's been a little tricky this adjustment and it's taken a little time and um i think i'm doing it which i'm pleased about i mean i'm 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 into writing a, a, another story that could very well turn into another novel and um i'm a bit surprised and uh, i'm glad that i'm able to make uh, make this transition but one of the differences about being up here is that uh, my moving back to New York City was a more, I, I grew up in New York City, but I've been in this area since college. So this is where my communities are. So even though I'm up here in a more rural area and I'm not seeing other lights on or seeing people walk by, when I do get together with friends, you know, we'll sit 10 feet apart in chairs and have a conversation. And of course, it's a much deeper connection. So that's good. That's good, but um, it, it's uh, again a bit of an apples and oranges experience. So for me to say, am I, do I like it better here than being in New York City? In some ways, yes. Did I prefer being in New York City? In some ways, uh, that was true. I also have a strong sense of, um, I think since I grew up in New York, the same thing happened when 9-11 hit. When 9-11 hit, my first reaction was, I have to get down there to make sure it's still there. And there was a part of me knowing that New York City was such a, an epicenter of this horrible virus, that there's a part of me that didn't want to leave because 
is it still going to be here when I get back? You know, this weird kind of thing, like I could, I, I, I'm going to be able to control what happens in New York City, you know, so it's, um, it's a tricky time. It's, uh, it's certainly a challenging time. Charles, where are you, where are you in New York? Are you in the city? To me? Yeah. No, no, I'm in Rochester, New York. Oh, in Rochester, New York. Okay. Um, we're just, I mean, it's, we're about to the point where we can uh, head outside without much problem. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to do that, but, but you know, uh, I, I guess what I'm getting at is the thematic impact of COVID uh, pandemic on, all right, let, let's see. Uh, I'm, I was working on a story called uh, Early Talent Late about a, uh, a songwriter, a songwriter uh, uh, performer in Nashville who had some early success and then fell off the map, uh, sort of disappeared into whatever you disappeared to in the 80s. And, and now he was trying to make a comeback. And if you, if you were in Nashville and you were trying to make a comeback, the place you would be showing up at would be uh, little venues, small little tight packed venues, uh, Station Inn, um, the Bluebird Cafe, these kind of places where people are packed in. That wouldn't happen today. People wouldn't be in, in those venues. So I, so I have to, I had to stop and think, well, do I make this now a historical piece? Is this, is this something I have to set back in the early 2000s for it to work? Uh, do I wait to see, do I just put this aside and wait to see what happens uh, when this thing is over? I mean, in whatever sense that's over. It's that, it's the consciousness of this, um, World War II booming outside as I'm trying to write <laughs> uh, that that's having an impact on what I'm doing is what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm intentionally not writing about COVID. I thought about a short story in relation right. to that. And I, I forget it. I don't know if it was um, Ann Tyler or somebody. I read something online that, you know, you don't write about an incident that's happening. Nothing good is written until years after it happens. Or something like that. But I, I, I did think of a short story when I'm out on my fire escape in New York and I this whole story unfolded where somebody else is out on the fire escape and this whole relationship starts and blah, 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 you know. And then I thought, no, I don't want to. That's not where I want my head to be. And that's not what I, I want to write about. Oh yeah, I think it would be crazy to try to write about yeah. the about the virus. As right it's going that, yeah. But yeah. my point is, we don't know what the world's going to be afterwards, and and that uh, that changes the way I think about uh, a piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you're not going, if if nobody's ever going to go into a place like the Bluebird again. Uh, and you're writing about an author, about a, a songwriter making a comeback, you better figure out what you're going to do with it. You know, it's just, that's... Right. Um, it would have to happen some other place in time. Have to, yeah, you'd have to go back. You'd have to make it a 1970s <laughs> story. Yeah. Like six months. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you, were you going to say something? No, I was, no, I was just going to say, or you have to figure out what a comeback would look like in a different... That's right. That's yeah, right. yeah, a whole other story could evolve. That would be. I I um, wrote, published six novels, under the edish, editorship of a guy named Fred Ramey, starting with Penguin Putnam and uh, going on through two other um, publishers that he was that he was um, associated with. And he's now become one of our, well, a Fomite author, actually, we just published a novel of his. So, uh, and he, 
was very leery to do this switcheroo, you know, where I was going to edit him after his <laughs> editing me. But it, it's worked out fine. Um, but Fred always used to say he he would always make sure that I didn't have anything current in my novels because he wanted me to be subspecies eternitatis, you know, and right. made me feel guilty about anything that, you know, would be uh, uh, locally referential in time. And, um, but the question that we have uh, had to face with Fomite is what does it mean to be relevant and especially politically, politically relevant if you're not going to directly address the issues that are happening now? And so it seems like there's two really different challenges that are out there, at least for me as a writer, one for Donna as a, as a publisher, that this business of can you write about COVID, the answers are very different depending on whether you're a writer or a publisher. And, uh, you know, Dr. Faustus was written in 48. Right. It was, well, it was written before 48, came out in 48. But yeah. Okay. But, it, 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 yeah. yeah, I mean, but never, <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, it yeah. was subspecies of Tani right, was, right, right. You know, right. And, Well, I, I knew, okay, in the, I knew a lot of, uh, early on when I was writing, I knew a lot of guys who started out r writing during World War II. And uh, uh, they would, they'd start, with Bansford's daily, I mean, they just kept, they would start, uh, um, and even think of Norman Mailer. Guys who started their, started to write before the war, went to the war, and then came back. And it took, it, it took, they tried to write about World War II, or they tried to work it into their art, and it really didn't work. I mean, most, most of, most of the novels they produced that inc included the, this world-changing event in their fiction didn't work as well as the stuff they were writing beforehand. And I mean, not into what, Catch-22 or something? Did World War II actually become um, something in fiction that worked pretty well? Yeah. I wonder if that's something, I wonder if that would be the difference between writing, non writing essays, writing nonfiction and right. writing fiction. Because if you get too, even if you're writing something in the past, I think if you get too caught up in fiction anyway, in the accuracy of what happened, you're losing that sense of who your characters are and other things that are very important in fiction. So I think that that, that could possibly the, be the danger for a fiction writer to write something now on COVID if they got too caught up with, but I want to be true to what's happening with COVID. I think you saw that a lot in a lot of AIDS writing. Right, right. People started, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to say writing too soon because that's, of course, that's up to, but it, it got very, some of the writing got very, um, like to, to get this point across about a, it, you, you lost the sense of fiction. You lost the sense of story. You lost the sense of the people. One of the, actually one of the most powerful things that I recently seen, um, oh, I'm gonna forget, is it The Inheritance on Broadway? The yes. part play, The Inheritance, is that? I think that's the name, maybe I'm screwing it up. It's something like that, yeah. Yeah, and, um, look at how long after right. that was written. And I think it was one of the most beautiful pieces right. that I've seen addressing that whole AIDS crisis pandemic. On the other hand, I don't think anything that was written while the AIDS was, pandemic was raging was written without consciousness of it. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, way, the way people wrote about relationships and sex and uh, uh, commitment and uh, I mean just disease and stuff changed 
because mm -hmm. everybody everybody was absolutely aware of what the costs were at, the, at that at that point and people were dying people you knew you know people were dying oh yeah i think i think that the writing that came out of that time the the political conscious i mean you know that was world changing right many right. of us at least for many folks like right. me tremendous world changing what i'm saying is that i just think as and it, it, it does it's not necessarily connected to writing about something in the time that it's happening i just think as a fiction writer you always have to be careful i mean i think you need enough information enough experience to be authentic in what you're doing right. i think if you get too caught up on getting the details right the specifics right all of that kind of stuff you could wind up losing something else in the character development and the story itself I, I don't know if that makes sense or not but you know oh, no, that makes perfect sense to me and it's it's a it's sort of a different problem than what i'm struggling with it's I, i'll go back to the aids thing i couldn't have written uh a novel before the aids uh pandemic and then and written the same novel after the AIDS pandemic, and they would have been different, even if they never mentioned AIDS, even if they never had anything to do with AIDS, because no one reading it would be unaware of the, the, the fact of AIDS, mm -hmm. the existence of AIDS. It was such a world-changing world event that it has to have some impact on how you think about art and how it fits, uh, how it fits, what you, what you're attempting to do with it, uh, and I, I think that's probably what we're looking at at this point. This, uh, like World War II, or like the flu epidemic, or like AIDS, there are some, um, some things that so change the reality around you that that's got to inform what you're doing, even if you don't deal with it directly. In, in fiction uh, and that's kind of what I that's kind of what, what I'm getting about how it's changing it's changing the way I think about what I'm doing <laughs> not so much what I'm doing uh, uh, it was interesting that uh, yesterday's discussion Friday's discussion the only person who start who was talking about doubting his role the validity and importance of his role as a writer was uh, uh, Mohan Rezai, who is a Iranian. He's writing in Tehran, and he he's wondering about whether that's appropriate now when people are sacrificing their lives on what he sees as the front line of different front lines. But all the Americans seemed to be, uh, uh, well, you know, one person uh, uh, said, you know, the whole function of art is to be able to, in times like these, to shed some light in the darkness, you know. And uh, so th those are really uh, opposite uh, kind of reactions to it. But one, is, but one, I think, typified the Americans, certainly does for me. Right. And one was somebody living under other, entirely other circumstances. Uh, and uh, uh, the target of American, uh, you know, when the bombs fall, our bombs will fall on him. Right. That, that was, uh, I don't know, interesting to me that nobody felt that they were, nobody felt, nobody doubted their role as a writer. Exactly. Yeah, nobody, nobody else but him had the sense that maybe things would be changed utterly by this. Uh, I, I, that's kind of what I'm hearing what you're saying. I think Americans don't think things are going to fundamentally change uh, because of COVID. I don't think Americans have that sense of things fundamentally or not some Americans do, but let's put it this way. I think a lot of um, um, white Americans don't have as strong a sense and of, of an experience of 
white straight Americans. Let me keep that <laughs> right. Don't have, have not lived an experience where they can really know firsthand how something has changed, how something can change every day. Totally, yeah. I, mean, I remember even as a kid at my, uh, you know, at my grandmother's um, holiday dinner tables, there seemed to be very different things said on a given topic by people, family members who were born in America and family members who were born in Europe and had lived through whatever they lived through. I had an aunt who, from Finland who lived through Russian occupation. I had an uncle who was um, a, a resistor during the rise of fascism. Um, you know, and somehow they just had, whatever they were talking about, they just, they had a sense of, you know, things can change. And I don't know that we, we have that. that sense. Again, I keep going. Like, I'm there. like a teenager in many ways. Right. I, I, but I keep going back to Adorno talking about how can you write after the Holocaust? How can you how can how can you write fiction at all after the Holocaust? I mean, that's something he engaged again and again. And it was that's where he came up with art has to be historiography and uh, a, you know consciousness of suffering or something. Yeah. I mean, um, and, and that, I guess that's what I'm thinking about. How, how is this, I don't know that we're gonna go back to normal. I hope not. Yeah, I normal, hope that is. Normal in America was nothing <laughs> right. no, right. I love it. I mean, it's a horrible price to pay. Horrible, horrible price to pay. And the sad thing is that my concern is that that's exactly what we're going to go back to. Go back to Maybe it's not going to be normal in the sense of for a while of whether or not you go into a restaurant or a bar, but there's other, there's other shit that's going to be normal. We're going to start with the, the, well, I mean, here's the perfect example. We're saying second phase and it's opening up. Well, who's opening up? Right. Is it the CEOs that are working from home on their computers right. or, are it the, or is it the, you know, the, the underclass that's, the frontliners that are serving America. So who's really opening up so much right now? So that already is telling me that we're going back to normal. But the entire economy is collapsing. It's got yeah. to collapse. Yes. yes. So Some, we, can't, we can't go back to normal. And, and I don't. I don't think Trump's going to let this let this be an easy return. Easy return to political normality either. Uh, uh, I mean, we're at a, it seems to me, we're at a much more fragile stage, a much more fragile point than we, than we, we are recognizing, it, you know, um, and I, I, wor I worry about it. Uh, we, uh, the screen says we have less than a minute <laughs> for, until they cut us off, but, and that's fine, uh, because this is, I think, a, a good discussion. But, all, but uh, when they cut us off in less than a minute, um, just if we want to continue talking, which I would like to do, okay. uh, just uh, uh, sign in again and we'll have this as a package, you know, and all right. send that or do whatever we want to it. So um, the guillotine is about to fall. When we signed in yesterday, we needed a password to sign in. I don't think so. You just click on the... Okay. On the the link that I the sent link, you, the yeah. link, yeah. yeah, and it will take you all the way through. Yeah, I don't think I had to type in the password this time, which I don't I've never had to type in the password. No, this time I didn't, but yesterday I did after or two when, when we had the other meeting. Other meeting, yeah. After, after the um, first forty minutes ended, when I tried to refresh it and get back in, I had to type in a password. Oh, uh, okay. Well, we'll, well see. we have to type in this password. We're in trouble. It'll be forty minutes to. <laughs> Okay, if we have to type in this password, see you later. <laughs> it was good. It was, I enjoyed this. I think it's been a really, really good, di good discussion. So yeah, and different. You know, we were worried about too few, too few people, uh, but this has been the most. Yeah, I'm the too few people. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's right people. what few people, right? <laughs>